How much fertilizer do we really need? The Soil Health Field Day at the farm of Dave Brandt over in Carroll, Ohio on April 5th, 2017. Coverage sponsored by Buckeye Soil Solutions, Agco, Mayor Farm Equipment, United Landmark LLC, Will Rogers Entertaining Speaker. Presenting on relating soil test results to crop nutrient requirements. Introducing all the way from Temple, Texas, Dr. Rick Haney, soil scientist with USDA Agricultural Research Service. I feel, I feel something deep inside for, for Gabe and my wife right now. All right, my name's Rick Haney. I've been, never been here before. Probably never going to come back here again. I didn't even get to the stage, and Dave Brandt goes, I hope you're as funny as Buzz and as smart. <laughs> I started to leave. All right. Can you hear me all right? Is this one of them newfangled things where you push on it and things happen? I'm going to be like Gabe, except I'm smarter than Gabe, so I'm going to turn my back on it and talk. It's not, that, would, that didn't go over well, Gabe. This is our research station from five years ago. That's my land that I farm research-wise. We're going to start out first here with a little bit of, there's a delay. There's a delay. See what I did there? Tough crowd. This, these guys are too smart. This is data. These, these are replicated field research from Illinois Fertilizer and Chemical Association. I pulled this off the web. This is terrific data. I wish there was a lot more of this going on. So this is for two, and they did this for two years. And it's really slick because like this one's right here, it's got the end rate, yield on the y-axis, and it shows all these different rates and all these different responses. So this is really good data. But we look at this, and I'm blind, so I'm gonna have to look at this. Is that all right, Randall? All right, when you look at this, what jumps out at you? Anybody, just speak up. Yeah, it's flat. That's what I get that a lot, it's flat. How did you make 100 bushel corn with no fertilizer? How? Anybody? Oh, it's all mineral, right? It's all residual nitrogen. No. But that sounds, that sounds good on paper. So that's corn after corn. Way to go. I qu I'm, I'm leaving. <laughs> God dang it. Let's restart. Is that my first one? There. Corn after soybeans. What the 50 pounds? 50 pounds of nitrogen made what? 150? Not possible. Corn after soy again. Over 100 bushel. Right? Here's your act. So this is what I wanted to show you. Since I'm, I crunched all these numbers, and what I want you to see here is there's corn yield, here's the, here's the rate, there's the response, right? There is no significant difference between the 150, the 200, 250, and 300 bushel yield. None. So why would you put out 300 pounds of nitrogen? when you can do it with 150. Why? This is not my data. This is, this is data from, from them. Tax problems. Tax problems. <laughs> I don't have a tax problem. But this is, this is important because, I mean, there's the data. Now, and, it, and Buzz talked about calibration. I love land-grant universities, by the way. I, I don't know what these guys are talking about. But... <laughs> This is, there's no difference there. So why are we putting that much on? But if you want to calibrate a, te a soil test, right? Do you see these points? No, you see the line. The points go away and you see the line. But that's misleading, isn't it? Because if you look at that, it looks like as you increase end rate, you increase fertilizer until it plateaus a little bit, way out there. At about what, 250? Uh, no, 150 is the target. So that can be misleading. So Buzz has got a good point about that. This is the actual response to yield from the fertilizer, where I took the controls out. We have guys that are calling, telling us all the time, we got this study set up, can we send you samples to look at? It's like, sure. You know, how many control plus do you have? None. 
We don't have any control plots. How do you know? These are, these are research scientists. How do you know what your response is? How do you know what you're looking at if you don't have something to compare it to? R squared, I didn't do that. That did that all by itself. There we go. See? Do you have a remote? Look at this. It's crazy. And I'm not hung over. People think that's what's happening here. I'm having a heck of a time here with this. Yeah. This is not working right. I need that one. Did you all see that one slide? No. God. Come on. Got it. That's it right there, isn't it? Yes. Look at the slope. 0.78. That's an important number, 0.78. What does that mean? If you want to raise 200 bushel corn, what's 200? What's 2 times 75, roughly? 150. That's what that showed, didn't it? Showed you 150 was your max in rate. That's, and that's from that same data. So it's, it's, it's real important how we interpret. I think Buzz made the point. It's important how we interpret. We, it's not just simple. It's not straightforward. It's not just easy. This stuff is complicated. It's a miracle that we can test soil in any way, shape, or form and get any kind of decent recommendation. We're talking about part per million, part per billion. And we've got some people running these instruments that aren't too sharp. So this is not easy. This is the actual pounds of N to grow a bushel of corn. So as we, this is interesting. This is their data off their website. As we increase the nitrogen rate, what happens to the Efficiency. It takes more nitrogen to grow a bushel of corn. This is not hard. This is not hard to see and understand. Here's the efficiency use. So the more nitrogen you put on, the less efficient the nitrogen is. Is that what we want to be about? No. We want to be more efficient. We're not anti-fertilizer, Gabe is. I'm not. I'm good, Gabe bad. Yeah, what? What? I'm a genius, you're not. That's what I hear. <laughs> I heard that rumor. All right. This is Gabe's brain on alcohol. <laughs> you can't probably read that. This is an atomic force microscopy image. This is new stuff. This is amazing. If you guys remember your chemistry class, you see those little red dots in the middle? Those are carbon atoms. Atoms. Those green lines in between those atoms are bonds, chemical, chemical bonds. We were taught this all throughout history. We have the technology to see it with our own eyes now. So what's holding us back? What's holding us back from farming smarter? Technology? Right in here. My buddy, who's my neighbor, is from Kentucky, and he has taught me something. He's taught me many things. We call him the beast, and he's got a prodigy, and now we found his grandfather. <laughs> but he said, I'm not asking you, Rick, to use all this. Use this, this part. And he thought, I'm not asking you to think like this. I want you to just move it from here to there, just a little bit. I was embarrassed and humiliated. He humbles me. He keeps me humble. My wife doesn't think, though. Lance Gunderson from Ward Labs is here. He's taught me more about that, too. Because Lance said, if you want to make a point, and I have to do this with Gabe, when we're talking, and Gabe will say something stupid, which is all the time, and I'll have to fly you. It's like, Gabe, use this, and you've got to lean forward. You've got to lean into it. <laughs> or he won't get it. It won't penetrate. Anyway, this, the technology is just mind-blowing. It's absolutely mind-blowing, the technology that we have at our fingertips today. And there's the proof. And I, and I just can't go on enough about how important that it is that we understand that it's not the technology holding us back. It's not the equipment we have. It's not the seeds we have. It's our minds. It's our brains. It's our emotions, our thoughts and feelings, and where we're trying to go in agriculture. Because we've had many discussions between us that the soil, you say the soil and the plant are one, and they are. 
Well, guess what? Where are we going back to when we die? The soil. We are come from the soil. We are part of it. It is an integrated system. We're the missing link. We're the missing link because we're not engaged with nature. We're not trying to emulate nature. So I'm going to go through this pretty quick. You guys have seen this. Gabe stole this slide from me. Nature's way, grows a living skin, cycles nutrients. We know these things. How we do it, strip off the soil. Or strip off the soil. That's what NRCS does when they land level, isn't it? Strip off the skin, you know, we can do better. We can put the skin back on. The cover crops are the key. You've got, you've got to have all the other stuff, but you've got to start doing the cover crops. You just have to. I, you, just, you can't get there without them, and I think that's important. I hear that there's a dealer around here somewhere local that sells them. I never met the guy. Working with nature, why mimic it? R&D much longer than us, research and development. I used to have a line for that, Gabe stole that. And this is important. It conserves water and it's tenacious. We have to be tenacious. We have to believe. You have to believe in something or you fall for anything or something. Stand for something or fall for anything. Ray and I were dancing to that song last night. <laughs> I wanted to show you a picture of my field research. This is my conventional till field. <laughs> We've been conventional tilling for three years now. It's coming along. Right beside it, we've got a no-till field. <laughs> My wife made these. She was very proud. Do you, don't you love their symbolism here, don't you think? Yeah. Who does that look like? <laughs> Thanks, you've been a great audience. <laughs> But now, what I love about this more than anything is you see the, the sun rays, so it's like God shining his light down on it, right? On the no-till. Yeah. But, but, God's simplest creature gets it. What are we doing? I mean, God's up there right now going, Gabe gets it, what the hell, who the hell are you people? Wow. That's fun. So I'm going to give you just a little bit of history. This is no-till versus conventional till from 1934. 1934. They were looking at microbes. Clover no-till. Around the root, 400 million per gram. In between the soil, 1,000. The root to soil ratio was 1,000 to 1 in the no-till. 1934. And then lucerne is another, this is from Russia, is another, that's a legume. And in conventional till, the root to soil ratio drops to 17 to 1. What does that tell you? What are the microbes? Around the roots. Interceding. Y'all ever heard of interceding? Dave, you'd be interested in this. You ought, to make a, you ought to make a device that you can intercede in standing corn. Yeah, wouldn't that be cool? Dave's like, you idiot, there's one right out there. Look at this. Cereal oats, barley grown in the same vessel with legumes and the absent nitrogen, blah, blah, blah. 1912. 1912. They knew that you could plant legumes with, with other crops and feed them nitrogen. 1912. That was, what, five years ago? <laughs> but that's my... It's, it's just... It flabbergasts me that we're, feed the soil, your soil will feed you. Give it something to eat. There it is. There's a the company, walnut something, nut, nut, nut seeds or something. They sell this kind of stuff. There's some cover crops we grew. A scientist. Huh? <laughs> Didn't kill it. What? <laughs> now we've got to tell that story, don't we? <laughs> So I missed Mr. Big Deal up in Texas, down in Texas, talking about all this stuff. Dave comes up there, 50 farmers, other scientists. I'm walking around, all arrogant. He agreed. I would be in. He's like, can't, I can't, I'm like, Dave, I don't know what happened. Can't get a stand. He's like, you hairpinned it, you idiot. You mowed it. Pull your head out of your. Come on. The other scientists were like, 
I love this guy. I don't know who this guy is. I already did that one, didn't I? No, well, that's, I, I already messed up. That's, the night, that's where they put the legumes in there, right? No, this is, this is 1928. Found nitrogen, nit, I can't even speak. Found nitrogen organic compounds in the root excretions of corn. What? How does plants' roots dump out organic nitrogen? Is that possible? Well, not now. It was in 1928. They had different soil. <laughs> Keith Dennis. Keith, look at Keith. This is, his, those are those, these are 12 fields that we've measured over and over. Something happened. You know what happened right there? Where it all jumped up? He didn't give up. He didn't give up. He started out down here, started doing the cover crops, put on a little nitrogen, jumped it up. But look at the average. This is his total nitrogen, organic and inorganic, across that. But here, this is so important. He did not give up. He kept going. He, he should have quit. He's older than me, if you can believe that. And he still changed and didn't quit. And my hat is off to you for that, mister. That's well done. I hope I'm that versatile when I'm Gabe's age. <laughs> here we are some more, a little more history. I sprinkled this through here. Roots of plants have a considerable influence on the accumulation of microorganisms in the soil. 1929-1934. How did we forget this? How did we not know this? There was a book that was sent to me by a guy from Germany that was published in 1958 by a Russian soil scientist. It's a big review. And it was translated by the Israeli Institute. Weird. I've never seen this book before. Ray sent it to me two years ago, and he's mad because I was so excited about it. This one had pictures. His didn't. <laughs> there they are. These guys are willing to help you. They're there to work for you. They're in your soil waiting on you, waiting on you to start, waiting on you to go. This is something else, an incredibly complex living system. Soil is the most difficult thing to understand that I've ever run across, and I've been married for 15 years. <laughs> Lovely woman. She, she'd have to be. These guys, they take in oxygen and give off CO2 just like we do. That's part of our testing. This is, it, it's, soil microorganisms are after carbon. You guys have heard a lot of stuff from about carbon, 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 right? And that's true, carbon. What are these soil microbes about? What are these fungi about? Reproduction. Vim and Gabe have similar beliefs in that two things. That's why they get along. That's all they're doing is trying to reproduce themselves, make more of themselves. So you've got to feed them. If you starve them, they won't reproduce themselves. If you feed them, they will, and they'll help you. It's that simple. How have we done? So now we'll talk about soil testing. Traditionally, we've treated it as a chemical system, right? You've all heard this before. It's easy to measure chemistry and not biology. Biology's tough. This is not an exact science not an exact science. Anybody that tells you that we can measure things exactly in the lab is lying to you or trying to sell you something. It's not an exact science. It's amazing we can get as close as we can, but it, this stuff is tricky. We're me measuring dynamic systems now. We are not measuring static systems anymore. That's different. We've got to get our heads around that. We've got to think about that. We've got natural variability we've never seen before because we've never measured it. So that's new. So it's growing pains. So we're going to have to think a little bit differently. We've tested it like a non-living, non-integrated system. Is that right? Is it non-living, non-integrated? No. Why do we test it like that? <coughs> Measure the house, not the food. Extract soil with chemistry it's never seen. These are not, these are not forward-thinking concepts. Dynamic soil. Y'all ever heard of that? Dynamic soil. Look at this. Soil solution represents very dynamic and indeed most active part. You can read that. Blah, blah, blah. 1902. 1902. I just, this just blew my mind. I just couldn't believe it. I, I, what are we trying to do? Ask the soil something, ask questions, and let it tell us. That's our biggest change in the way we test soil, is we ask it, tell us what you're doing. What do we need? What do you need from us? Not, 
You're not, we're going to get it in there and waterboard it, torture it, rip out the numbers we want, and go good. That's not the way it works. Passive. What's your condition? Are you in balance? What can we do to help? Those are more positive questions, aren't they? Soil drying and rewetting. Soil's dry and rewet. That's natural. It rains. I remember so clearly, you guys, at this big meeting of scientists many, many years ago, and the guy, we were showing him the one day CO2 test where we were rewetting the dried soil, and he said, You can't do that. That's too simple. And he said, You know, that's not natural. <laughs> because soils never dry out and it never rains. And I said, buddy, what do you think happens when soils dry out and it, and it rains? Isn't that drying and rewetting? You know, you know what his answer was? He was really smart. He walked away. <laughs> did, how, well, how do you argue with that? When you guys, when it rains and you notice plants get greener, why do they get greener? Because of the water? Because it rained? If you want to green up a green crop like wheat, what do you put out there? Nitrogen. That's why the plant's green. It's that drying and rewetting cycle. Soil's dry, it rains, there's an explosion of microbial activity, all this organic nitrogen gets pumped up, they convert it to nitrate or ammonium, and off it goes into the plant. This happens without our consent, without any scientific basis whatsoever. I'm so sick of hearing, we've got to get the science right on this soil health, right? We've got to get the science right. The science is happening right out there in Dave Brandt's field, right now. Just because we don't understand it doesn't mean it doesn't happen, does it? That's like saying, we've got to get this God thing figured out or he obviously doesn't exist. <laughs> That's, what's the difference? That doesn't make any sense. Nutrient cycle, there it is. Water, O2, the microbes, you chew on these organic car carbon compounds and release CO2. That's what we're trapping. We're, we're, we're measuring that CO2. But coupled to that CO2 is nitrogen and phosphate coming back. That's the important thing. Or you can put it all out as fertilizer, or you can let them give it to you for free. Your choice. This is uh, back in 1994 when I knew. I didn't even know Gabe then, and I knew I was a genius. Look at this. These microbes, those, soil, those are three soils, and the more fertile as you go down. And there's that little one-day CO2 bump. You see it? There under time and days, under one. See how those bumps get bigger? The more fertile the soil is, the higher the CO2 respiration we got out of it. How much simpler does it need to be than that? I thought everybody was going to love this in just a few years. What, what year is this? <laughs> Fun. There's CO2 versus 30. We used to incubate soils for 30 days in an incubator and trap the carbon. 30 days to get that measurement. Look at that relationship between CO2 within the, one to one, the first one to six hours after drying or rewetting. Why wait 30 days to get your answer? You can get it quick. That's an amazing relationship and it holds steady. Here it is with amino sugar nitrogen. Same thing, it's correlated, it's connected, it's interconnected. Just because we didn't understand it didn't mean it wasn't happening. Yeah, this is my first attempt at publishing. It's too simple. You know, I about quit graduate school. I, that's when I ran right smack dab into academia. I didn't understand. I came off the farm, got my PhD when I was 42. I didn't understand. I thought everybody would be thrilled. Wow, look at this. And they were like, no, that won't work. Our soil's different, you know. Okay. This is my favorite slide right here. The respiration of the soil is an indication of biological and biochemical processes taking place in it. It can also serve as an index of soil fertility as a whole, as is maintained by Scola, who, whoever, 1905. I've said that. I've said that. Really? Now I'm doing gay. Really? Why did it take an Okie to bring this act back after 100 years? I'm an Okie. It wasn't here. <laughs> That's right. This was because Gabe Brown et al., which means and others, 2017, fairly recent quote, because he's mentally challenged. I'm mentally challenged. We were overthinking it all this time. We weren't looking for the simple things. Let's look at the simple things. Nature, biomimicry, look at these things. This is going to lead the way forward, not the complex. So, soil extraction. I made my own extracted. Why? 
because we didn't mimic what a plant root was doing. Because when a plant root's in the system, it's a different ball game. As opposed to a, when we take soil samples and send them to the lab, you know, is there, are we testing that soil with a living root growing in it? No. We all know these, these roots are dumping these organic acids and these different compounds into the soil. Do we see that in the lab? No. Then what are we testing? That's why we came up with that. We've been doing it, Buzz went over this stuff. I mean, we've just kind of been doing it from the 70s and 80s. So maybe we can just move in a different direction. I don't know where the idea came from. Root excretions, organic substances of the great importance. 1894. 1894. The acids were detected 1907, 1906, 1907, 1909. Those were all peer reviewed back then. So, what did we miss? What happened to us? We were headed in that direction. Phosphate. Complex. You could use a couple of different machines, a bunch of different soil extractants. These are the things that we do. We measure, we use both machines. We use our extractant, but we look at respiration, C to N ratios, P mineralization, the activity of calcium, iron, aluminum. We're looking at more as an integrated system. We're trying to understand what we're looking at. We're trying to let it teach us what we're looking at instead of us teach the soil how to grow. It already knows. Soil organic matter is the house. The microbes see the food. They don't see the house. They see the food. And what we're trying to measure with this water extractable organic carbon is the food they see. The machines are very similar, but one does percent organic matter and the other one does part per million. That's a big difference. One percent is 10,000. Is that right? Where's, where's Lance? Is that right, Lance? Whatever you say, Gene. That a boy. He picked right up. See? Are you sure you don't? This is a simple thing here. Here's soil organic carbon from Maine, a couple from Wyoming, Idaho, and Texas. It's one of my favorite graphs because people in Texas don't like that graph. <laughs> but you look at the axis, 0 to 50,000 part per million. As, that's basically soil organic matter. It's big, lots of carbon, right? When we do a water extract, a water extractable soil organic carbon test, we don't see that same stair step, do we? What happened? The main soil had the highest organic matter. Why didn't it have the highest water extractable organic carbon? Because the microbes don't see that all that. They see what's, in, what's soluble in the water. There's the microbial respiration, microbial activity. Does that look like that? Looks almost exactly like that, doesn't it? Versus that. It doesn't look like that. So that's the food. That's why we, I, it's fine to measure organic matter. I got no problem with that. But this water extractor organic carbon will tell you a little bit more. It'll get you a little bit farther in there so you can see a little deeper into what your soil's doing. Here they are side by side, same soil. The slope of those lines is almost identical. So we're measuring a subfraction of the organic matter, the stuff that's really active. Nitrogen, we, we run all these tests for nitrogen. Right now, nitrate's about your only game, maybe a little ammonium. 1965 is when they started using two molar KCL to extract soil for nitrogen, why? Because they wanted to kick the ammonium off the cation exchange sites to add a little bit to it. How many soils see two molar potassium chloride? None. See, so we get in the lab and we think different than if we think about what's happening outside. That those were disconnected. And we're trying to connect those things. So we measure total nitrogen in a water extract. We measure the inorganic nitrogen. And by difference, we get the organic pool. That organic pool is absolutely important. We've never seen that before. And it explains a lot about your soil. That's nitrogen that's going to be plant available over the growing season. We haven't seen that before. That's important, isn't it? This is a long-winded way right here of saying, this is how we calculate nitrogen from the organic pool that's going to be delivered to your, your plant. That's a long-winded way to say it. But what this actually is telling you is that, because we get these, these things, and is Dan Davidson here? Dan? There he is. We get these people saying, this, well, this is a one-day CO2 respiration. It's too variable, don't we? We get that. Well, yeah, soils are variable. 
So what? Here's, we're looking at a 60 part per million response in CO2 versus a what? 300? That's this blind. Yeah. We credited one soil with 80 pounds and the other with 48. Because we had huge changes in CO2. Guess how much we would have credited out of that pool without respiration and water extract for organic nitrogen? Zero. So would you rather have 48 or 80 or none? I'd rather have the 48 or 80 credited to my account so I can take it off the nitrogen. So we don't really care too much how, if there's a little variability in one day CO2. That's no big deal. We can account for that. We can handle that. Because we don't use one measurement to, to predict anything. We use five or six or whatever. We integrate this. This makes it more robust, harder to fool. So when we use this test, if we're just going to test for nitrate, that's the one in the middle, right? We only miss those. We only miss the rest of them. Those are all organic nitrogen compounds. We miss every one of these if we're just going to focus on nitrate. And that is sad to me because the farmers don't need to be spending more money than they have to, don't you think? Margins are pretty tight. We should be doing everything we can to help. Let's look beyond one thing. So, since 1965 with 2 molar KCL, we've been only missing half the nitrogen that's actually available, just half. So instead of 36 pounds, there was another 34 we weren't seeing. It's tough to calibrate a test when you missed half of what you're looking for, isn't it? Boy, we're trying to mimic how the soil responds after rain, it rains in the field. That's important. We haven't ever really tried to do that before. That's what we're trying to do in the lab. We're trying to mimic nature in the lab. And that's a very different way to think about it. Here's our methods. Water extract from organic carbons. We measure total nitrogen. This stuff's just probably boring to you. I'm getting bored. Does anybody want to leave? I saw five hands go up right over there. We integrate all this information. We're trying to pull this together. We're trying to let this soil tell us something. There's all these things going on, and they're all interconnected, which is what I was trying to show with this. When I look at the results from the test that we do, I wanted to show you this, because what I look for, I want to, where's Ray, Ray? Which one's the pasture? Soil from the pasture sample. Look at the soil health score. Oh, yeah. 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 See the one-day CO2? See the organic carbon is 345. The one-day CO2 is 238. Boy, that's a pasture. We can pick out pastures versus cropping systems versus no-till. We can pick these things out. It's real sensitive. But what we're looking for here, when I look at this, is I want to see, the first thing I look at is that column R. What's your organic carbon, your water extractable organic carbon? And then the second thing I look at is the respiration and how are they related. We've got a farmer, or a, in our, he's in our CS, isn't he, Adam? Adam Doherty? Adam Doherty? He's, got, he's been sending us samples for three years, and his water extract for organic carbon runs around 150 to 200. His respiration runs anywhere from 200 to 500. How is that possible? They like the carbon they're seeing in his soil. When we see these numbers upside down, high carbon and low respiration, they don't like the carbon they're seeing. And we see that mostly in tilled, tilled soil. Not no-till, not covers. It flips it. So we can see these relationships. What's that? Oh, this is the NPK stuff. Yeah, so there's the NP205 and K2O we find in your soil. We got a little fertilizer calculator you can use or not use. You can contact whoever you want. Go with those numbers, and I think you'll be surprised at what you can find. This is a quick example. If we just test for nitrate and nitrogen in these two soils, they both had exactly the same nitrate and nitrogen. So the soil health was on soil one was eight, so we're going to grow 200 bushel of corn, so the recommendation was 180 pounds of N. This came out of our lab. Soil two. Same nitrate, 
A lot more respiration, a lot more carbon, a lot more organic nitrogen, soil health score is 26. Recommendations 100 pounds. You think soil health matters? Yes. I don't know about you guys, but you know, I'll take the 80 pounds of nitrogen savings at 40 cents a pound or whatever, so that's $32 an acre. 1,000 acres, that's $32,000. Your yield won't fall. If we can do this better, now, I'm almost done. Y'all just hang with me just a little bit longer. This is Frankenbreather. This is something we built literally out of parts from the lab. And this is a new service that we're going to offer here pretty soon. I don't know if you can see it very well, but there's little, jar, there's little cups of dirt inside those jars right there. And so we wet them up with these, these different compounds. Simple acids, amino acids, various things. We replicate it all. And this thing runs for 24 hours, and it samples every sample, every soil every two hours. Goes to the next one, samples the soil every two hours. We get, when what we get from that is a look at what those microbes have seen before. That's a Texas hay field, or both Texas hay fields more or less, but well, this is a hay field where they take hay off. That's a pasture where they've got cattle on it. Now look at the difference. You see how that's a lot more active the red, the red dots, I think those are red, is octalic acid. That's a typical response of a hay field that we see there on the left. What we want to see, when you, put the, when you put the animals in the system, everything starts moving. They start responding. They've seen these compounds before. They haven't seen them in this one. So you're going to be able to send us a sample, soil sample. We'll run this system on it. We'll come back and say, you know, maybe you need this many legumes, this many grasses, this many brassicas. We're trying to give food to your microbes and then tell us, I've had that before. And if they don't, if they don't respond to it, that means I need it. So we're going we're gonna to suggest adding whatever you're missing. So again, it's trying to get the microbes to tell us more information. All right, I get this question a lot. No-till or conventional till? I don't care. Plant the covers. You don't need any soil test. You don't need any research to tell you how to improve your soil. You don't. Nature's been showing us all, all along. You've seen these guys, tough act to fall. These guys come through here. These guys are out there doing it. What did Buzz say? We wait on science. We're all going to be broke. Yeah. These guys, let these guys help you. Do this, do this stuff together with your neighbors. Farm with innovation. Farm with something new. Farm with new thinking. Farm forward thinking. We can't bear our heads in the ground and, and, and move forward in this country, or in, in the world for that matter. And if you've got to go it alone, go it alone. Gabe did. Dave did. Keith almost did. He had Dave. We've got to do something different. We can't keep doing the same thing. I've never seen such farmers. I've seen farmers across this country are excited about farming again. That's amazing. It's amazing. Plants fix dirt. You cannot fix dirt with chemistry. You fix it with plants. You fix dirt with plants. That's my take home message to you. That's where I got stuck, because I'm a farmer. But I got stuck in my cover crop field. Because I'm holding too much water. See, that's why I went back to conventional till. No, I'm just kidding. These two yahoos helped me in the lab. I can't get through this without mentioning them. I couldn't do it without them. Chris and Buddy, that's it. Any questions? No, I didn't do very good. Don't do that. Yes, sir. Sort of an ideal number because what goes on in the soil is so determined on the weather during that season that yep. those numbers may be different. Yes. So but, how do you, how do you well, I've also heard that uh, depending on uh, the weather, your fertilizer may or may not work. What was that question earlier? What if you have a drought and you had to build up your phosphate? 
If you have a drought, it really don't matter what your phosphate buildup is, does it? No, I'm just messing with you. I understood. But, but I get this a lot from people. That it's like, well, how do you know those numbers are good? Well, if it don't rain, it don't matter, does it? it I mean, you've got to have water to make this system go. So... Not so much, because we're looking at biology, mainly. You know, we're, we're extracting uh, and looking at organic pea, just like anybody else, but we're also adding some of that biology and that organic pea into there, so it doesn't, doesn't affect it too bad. Time of year? Time of year is when you need to know something. Hey, Rick, repeat the question. What was the question? Yeah, he wanted to know if the soil moisture affects the analysis. And I said not so much because we're looking at a biological system mainly and not so much an inorganic system. So we're going to dry everything down and rev it back up so it won't matter too bad. And then he said time of year. When do you want to know something? Do you want fertilizer recommendations? Do you just want soil health? You know, if you want to see your highest soil health, possibly probably in the summer sometime when things are really going. Good moisture, good, good water. Yes, sir. Are you talking? I'm sorry. We're not quite ready for prime time yet. No, no, but is that where you're heading? Yes. Yep. Yeah, we want to try to. We spent four years trying mixes at our place, the 200 acres that we've gotten, and I still don't have it down. And so we, we tested our microbes, and they were like, you need the legumes back, buddy. We have not, we're not seeing them anymore. And so that was real clear. So. Now, we're not going to get, what was that comment, Ray Steyer? I didn't choose your wife, I'm not going to choose your cover crop. Right. <laughs> yeah. Broad, yeah, it'll be broad, but, but we're going to be a little more specific on, because right now we're kind of guessing off the soil health score. This is going to be a little more, yeah, they, they haven't seen this, so they'd respond to it. We just trust them on that. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Okay. Well, about Gabe? <laughs> oh, me? Oh, that's the first I've heard of it. <laughs> that's correct. They are right. It does not re relate back to the normal response curve because the normal response curve doesn't have biology in it. Yep. Okay. You, you've asked for it now, haven't you? <laughs> Bear with me, Jay. <laughs> Does that look like that's calibrated to you? That, let's see, our, at, at total available in at 200 pounds, we get a yield of anywhere from 60 to 250. But they don't show that. No, they show the line. They don't show the points. I'm not bad-mouthing them. It's like, let's do better. We can do better than this. We can do better than what we had 50 years ago. We've got better data. We've got better understanding. Come on. Don't sit there and give me crap about your test ain't calibrated. Neither is yours. So let's be honest. I'm not asking for a fight here. I'm asking for let's be honest and work for these farmers that we were sent here to help. That's what I'm about. I've got to stop there. I'm <laughs>